Chapter 26 Holiness and Health Leviticus 15, 1-33 And the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When any man hath a running issue out of his flesh, because of his issue he is unclean, and this shall be as uncleanness in his issue, whether his flesh run with his issue, or his flesh be stopped from his issue, it is his uncleanness. Every bed whereon he lieth that hath the issue is unclean, and every thing whereon he sitteth shall be unclean. And whosoever toucheth his bed shall wash his clothes, and beeth himself in water, and be unclean until the even. And he that sitteth on anything whereon he sat that hath the issue shall wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the even. And he that toucheth the flesh of him that hath the issue shall wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the even. And if he that hath the issue spit upon him that is clean, then he shall wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the even. And what saddle whatsoever he rideth upon that hath the issue shall be unclean. And whosoever toucheth anything that was under him shall be unclean until the even. And he that beareth any of those things shall wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the even. And whomsoever he toucheth that hath the issue, and hath not rinsed his hands in water, he shall wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the even. And a vessel of earth that he toucheth, which hath the issue, shall be broken, and every vessel of wood shall be rinsed in water. And when he that hath an issue is cleansed of his issue, then he shall number to himself seven days for his cleansing, and wash his clothes, and bathe his flesh in running water, and shall be clean. And on the eighth day he shall take to him two turtle doves, or two young pigeons, and come before the Lord unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and give them unto the priest. And the priest shall offer them, the one for a sin offering, and the other for a burnt offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord for his issue. And if any man's seed of copulation go out from him, then he shall wash all his flesh in water, and be unclean until the even. And every garment, and every skin whereon is the seed of copulation, shall be washed with water, and be unclean until the even. The woman also with whom man shall lie with seed of copulation, they shall both bathe themselves in water, and be unclean until the even. And if a woman have an issue, and her issue in her flesh be blood, she shall be put apart seven days, and whosoever toucheth her shall be unclean until the even. And everything that she lieth upon in her separation shall be unclean. Everything also that she sitteth upon shall be unclean. And whosoever toucheth her bed shall wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the even. And whosoever toucheth anything that she sat upon shall wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the even. And if it be on her bed, or anything whereon she sitteth, when he toucheth it, he shall be unclean until the even. And if any man lie with her at all, and her flowers be upon him, he shall be unclean seven days, and all the bed whereon he lieth shall be unclean. And if a woman have an issue of her blood many days out of the time of her separation, or if it run beyond the time of her separation, all the days of the issue of her uncleanness shall be as the days of her separation, she shall be unclean. Every bed whereon she lieth all the days of her issue shall be unto her as the bed of her separation, and whatsoever she sitteth upon shall be unclean, as the uncleanness of her separation. And whosoever toucheth those things shall be unclean, and shall wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the even. But if she be cleansed of her issue, then she shall number to herself seven days, and after that she shall be clean. And on the eighth day she shall take unto her two turtles, or two young pigeons, and bring them unto the priest, 
to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the priest shall offer the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for her before the Lord for the issue of her uncleanness. Thus shall ye separate the children of Israel from their uncleanness, that they die not in their uncleanness, when they defile my tabernacle that is among them. This is the law of him that hath an issue, and of him whose seed goeth from him, and is defiled therewith, and of her that is sick of her flowers, and of him that hath an issue, of the man and of the woman, and of him that lieth with her that is unclean. Leviticus 15, 1-33 This is one of the chapters in the law often cited by people who argue that the law is impossible nonsense. The very precision and subject matter condemn it for many who feel, as did Viscount Melbourne, that things have come to a pretty pass when religion is allowed to invade the sphere of private life. Melbourne's statement highlights a curious fact. He objected to allowing Christianity any role in a man's private life For him, it was a formal fact of public life. Twentieth century man denies to Christianity any jurisdiction in public life and relegates it to the private sphere for those who choose to allow it there. In reality, the jurisdiction of biblical faith is cosmic and total and therefore inclusive of both public and private spheres. It is noteworthy also that Knight cites this chapter as one of the sources of near immunity of Jews from plagues and epidemics over the centuries. He observes, The near immunity of the Jew from infection in reality sprang from the fact that he kept strictly the laws and hygiene that we find in our book of Leviticus. There are several distinct sections in Leviticus 15. First, in verses 2 to 15, we have reference to a diseased sexual discharge in men, The Septuagint seems to identify this as gonorrhea, and most commentators agree. However, the requirements of this law are clearly applicable to all sexual diseases. The law specifies various sanitation requirements for the course of the disease. On being pronounced clean, various sacrifices are required. Treatment is not prescribed, but the prevention of contagion is stressed. The priest formally readmits the cured man to covenant life and pronounces him cured. The treatment was left to practitioners. Second, verses 16 to 18 require purification, simple bathing after normal sexual relations in marriage. The key to this section as to all of this chapter is verse 31, which makes it clear that it is referenced to the sanctuary. People were unclean in relation to the sanctuary, for these specified conditions. Their condition might be, as in verses 2 to 15 and 25 to 30, a diseased one, or it might not. There were hygienic considerations in the laws, but the common factor in all is also the requirement of purification before participating in the life of the sanctuary. This is still the practice in Orthodox Judaism and was for centuries a church requirement. This meaning in Jewish practice over the centuries is noted in Hertz's comment that the reference is to the sanctuary. Hertz said also, The uncleanness described in verses 16 to 18 did not apply to laymen. It involved merely absence from the camp, which in rabbinic exegesis was taken to mean the sanctuary proper and the Levite encampment around the sanctuary. It also involved abstention from sacrificial food, Teruma and Mazar. If the prescribed priestly ablutions had been taken, the prohibition ceased in regard to the Levite encampments and Mazar. The sections which refer to women and their discharges apparently have a like reference, given the statement of verse 31. They echo also the commandment of Exodus 19, 10-15 which, among other things, barred the fertility cult belief that sexuality is a central means of communion with God. There is no hint that sexuality is other than God created and good. There is, however, a strong bar against the association of sexuality with worship. 
Pagan antiquity and continuing cults to the present have viewed God essentially as the generative source and hence best served and worshipped by generative acts. Thus, the practice of prostitution and often of various perversions was a part of temple or shrine devotion. In such faiths, prostitution by the woman and castration by the man constituted the supreme acts of religious devotion. God's law bars all such practices. Third, in verses 19 to 24, we have laws concerning menstrual discharges. Again, this has reference to the sanctuary. In Leviticus 18.19, sexual intercourse during menstruation is banned, and in 2018, we have reference to this as a violation of the separateness and integrity of a woman. Thus, while she cannot, if a Levite's wife, partake of the sanctuary meals, she has, in relation to her husband, the affirmation of freedom. She is not his creature, but God's, and both man and wife are under his law. Fourth, in verses 25 to 30, we have a general reference to abnormal discharges by a woman, and these may or may not be contagious and or diseased. Again, the required precautions follow. Fifth, in verses 31 to 33, we have a summary statement. In verse 31, the central purpose is given to maintain the holiness of the kingdom of priests and of the sanctuary. This makes clear an important fact. For modern man, health concerns are essentially personal and then social. For scripture, health is a religious matter. Holiness requires our total dedication to God and our total health, moral, physical and theological, so that we may render the best possible service to the triune God. By making health an essentially personal concern, we have made it clear that man's chief concern is his own well-being in terms of purely personal goals. When a wife tells her husband to take better care of himself for the family's sake, she is aware, however fragmentarily, that health is more than a personal matter. Scripture tells us that it is a religious one, a matter of holiness and service to God. At this point, an important distinction must be made again. Sickness and death exist because this is a fallen world. They are, in origin, the results of sin. As we contract ailments, these may or may not be the results of sin. A disease contracted can be a consequence of sin, as are the majority of cases of sexually transmitted diseases. A cold or the flu may be a result of carelessness, and it may not be, we live in a world which, being fallen, exposes us to some hazards. Thus, particular instances of sickness cannot be, per se, defined as immoral. To do so is immoral. What must be stressed is that holiness requires that wholeness of person which sets forth the total health of man. The quarantined persons are not, if godly, separated from God. They are separated from the covenant community in order to preserve the general health and the working ability of society.